Hello, Kevin. Hello there. Thanks for typing. This is Steve Gilmore, and uh, this is the Gilmore Gang, the last Gilmore Gang of the year. I love to say that. Uh, Robert Scoble, welcome. Hey, what's up? What what is up? I don't know. Uh, Christmas and Hanukkah and New Year's. <laughs> Hanukkah was last month. Uh, uh, Hanukkah was Hanukkah. Because with Thanksgiving this year. That's right. Yeah, it all just meshes together. Happy holidays. <laughs> there was a great show on CNN uh, that explains why it's all meshed together. It all came from the same group of insane uh, radicals. Well, also, it's to do with the solstice, isn't it? So it's, it's kind of synchronized to the rotation of the Earth. Welcome, Kevin. <laughs> uh, also, welcome, uh, Keith Tier. Hi. I, I'm back developing it. I'm back from China. Yeah, that's right. So, you know, almost n- famous, but except in China so far. That's my wife's job. My wife tells all our friends, Keith's big in Silicon Valley in China. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, speaking of big, here's uh, John Tyshek. Welcome, John. Welcome. Thank you. It's good to be here, Steve. <laughs> Excellent. My mood has improved immensely. So I will be having coughing fits throughout the show, but hopefully they will not be on camera uh, since I'm suffering from the uh, uh, year-end cold that I always get so that when everybody else is running around enjoying the holidays, I'm lying in bed enjoying the holidays. It's actually much better. He does it on purpose. So... Uh, Facebook has been amazing the last couple of days. Uh, Tina's been posting all these pictures uh, from the 80s, uh, and it's amazing what we look like in the 80s. (laughs) I'll leave it at that, because I can't remember any of it. (laughs) I can remember a little bit. (laughs) Uh, John Tashek, how was your holiday uh, weekend? Why do you ask? Uh, My holiday weekend was good. Yeah. The kids were the kids had a great time. What did they, you do? Uh, they still have that uh, wild-eyed wonder of of the Christmas time, and I posted some pictures on Facebook, and everyone appreciated them. And uh, Keith, you were in China for the holidays, or, or were you already back? I was already back. I came back on the nineteenth. And how have your holidays been? This is Luke, by the way. Hey, everyone. Say hi, Luke. Hi. Merry Christmas. What's up, Luke? (laughs) How old is Luke? (laughs) Luke is seven. Wow. And uh, he's very happy because he's been playing on an Xbox One with his big brothers for the last two days. Are you done with your call? (laughs) What's better, the Xbox (laughs) or Minecraft? Yeah, great, Dad. Are you? Can you get off the bandwidth, please? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and Kevin, what was your uh, holiday like? Oh, um, it's very relaxing. My 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 boys are much older. They're they're teenagers, so uh, much less focus on presents and more on hanging out and chatting and eating together, which is very nice. And Andrew coming back from London, which is good. Okay, I think we've caught up. <laughs> so enough about uh, what you just said. <laughs> Uh, Robert Scoble, what's going on in the uh, in the world of uh, technology? Oh, uh, Ohm is arguing with some guy over whether uh, 2013 was a last year in tech. Yeah, I, I thought Ohm's article was terrific, yeah. as usual. He he put a, a a great perspective on a on a link bait article by some yes. guy I've never heard of. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, well, QC has quite a lot of good stuff, but that was that was a bit. Eh. Um, <coughs> for me, it's it's more like a it's a year of um, consolidation in tech. Well, the thing that's happened this year is that the bunch of stuff that we were talking about last year has gone mainstream very quickly, which means that you know everyone now has smartphones and tablets and lots of devices that are that are connected to each other, and that's the that's the transition that's happened this year. Which means that next year we can take that for granted rather than um, seeing it as a as a place you build. That that's a that's a big difference for me this year. John Toshek, do you agree? (laughs) 
Sorry, there's a high pitched uh, sound. Yeah, going who's, my brain. who's doing that, by the way? Um, I don't know. It Do I agree be. with Ohm's article? No, with uh, Kevin's analysis of uh, a year of consolidation. Oh, we haven't seen anything yet. So, in other words, we haven't seen anything yet about what actually happened in 2013, or no, what's going to uh, no, happen it's, next uh, year. This is a drip in the a drop in the bucket of you know consolidation of technology. You're going to see it, you know, escalate in 2014. Well, I think the whole point that guy was trying to make was Apple didn't announce anything interesting this year. And if that's how you look at the tech industry, I guess I guess you're right. Oh, he's got a point there, but I don't agree with that either. Well, I, I like the fingerprint sensor. <laughs> Yeah, I like the uh, iPad Air. Incredible. Yeah, but that... Uh, um, That's incredible. Do you yeah, have one? Yeah, I don't Robert, know. you don't have it, do you? They're, it, it's not the breakthrough product that we... Uh, um, I we, totally we disagree. It's completely a breakthrough product. Uh, okay. It does everything that Steve Jobs wanted to do five years ago. And it does the same thing that the iPad 3 did. I mean, no, I, except no, it it's thinner. And it's faster. Okay, Tina great. has an iPad 3. Uh, sitting next to this one. This one's smaller. It's faster. Yeah. Uh, it's easier to use. It's more convenient. That's called iteration. I, I, I'm not turned on. Well, by it's iteration. consolidation. That's what I was getting at. The, the, the point is that, um, you know, when the iPad 3 came out, it wasn't quite there. It was a little slow. The, the performance wasn't there. It's still a bit heavy. Um, it's still a lot more expensive. Whereas now, you know, it's not just. It's not just that the the iPad Air is is a is a solid platform, but the the tablets are mainstream. The idea of a tablet is mainstream, and the um, install base of, of the Android tablets too means that it's it's a very very broad based thing. It's not just you know the five hundred dollar Apple thing. It's the um, hundred dollar tablets and things that are spreading out as well, which means that these things are are, are really mainstream now. Um, on the other hand, uh, twenty fourteen looks like we're going to see two new Apple products, a TV product, and not a big screen TV product, a, a box that goes on the TV, and a, a iWatch. And I think both of those have the potential of being breakthrough products, the kinds of things that get us excited. John, I understand you're having problems hearing unless you mute. Yeah, as soon as I unmute, I can't uh, I hear, so everything's kind of clipped. Okay, you there's a... There's a full duplex switch. Yeah, I can hear you. There's a full duplex switch in your Skype client. Uh, I I wonder whether you've got that set, and I certainly wonder whether we have it set at this end. So uh, that's something that we can... Let's just limp along with this, uh, and then next year it'll be all new, uh, fantastic everything, and nothing will ever go wrong again. <laughs> that's my New Year's resolution. Anyways, so, there, there was there was a lot even in, in the Apple ecosystem. I mean, they bought this company called Prime Sense, which is a 3D sensor that's pretty rocking. And if you look at one of those sensors and you don't think anything's happening in the industry, um, you you really haven't considered what's going on. I, I would separate it between was there any innovation, and I think Ohm's clearly right about that. From where is the innovation coming from? And there is a kind of an interesting subplot which is that Google and Apple, and arguably even Facebook with its acquisitions, um, is driving most of the innovation. And innovation coming from startups and Sand Hill Road is somewhat undermined by the whole hacker hire movement. And, and, and the, what we're seeing is like the, the re-consolidation of the big guys. And, e and even you guys at Salesforce, look at all the acquisitions you made this year. It feels like the big guys are um, the big guys are really in the driving seat, and we haven't yet seen the mobile era give rise to its Google or its Facebook. Hmm. hmm. Snapchat. There's a bunch of messaging apps that are getting pretty interesting. You know, Snapchat turned down three billion dollars this year. Um, yeah, but they're not really. I mean, I, I agree with that, but. You don't think of them in the same breath as a Google. Uh, you know, usually platform change creates huge new companies that dominate the era. We haven't seen that yet. Did um, anyone read that uh, the study from Europe that showed that Facebook is dead to uh, you know basically teenagers and younger? Um, that might be true, but as soon as they need a job, they're going to be on it. 
So Facebook is an enterprise solution. Yeah, it's grown up. Um, you know, I, I asked an audience, you know, um, uh, in in London, who's not on Facebook? And out of 150 people, one hand went up. I go, that's why everybody's going to be on it. Uh, it's it's a system you have to be on if you want to if you care about <laughs> customers and all that. I mean, you don't I, think I, uh, Instagram or uh, Snapchat would just no, of... that's not the same thing. I'm I, I'm on Snapchat now, um, and we had a little bit of fun with it when I was drunk the other night. But um, good thing it deletes those posts. Yeah, you know <laughs> that's what it's for. <laughs> but it's Did not you? a business. It's not a business tool. I'm sorry. You know. what, it does, one of the things that uh, happened in China is I bumped into Ray Lane. He was speaking at a conference I was speaking at, uh, and I got about 10 minutes with him. And he made the point that, uh, and you're, you, you, we haven't talked about this on the show, but Kleiner Perkins went through a huge reorganization last week. Yeah. Um, and um, uh, he told me that you know, he's spending less and less time there and asked him why. And he said that the venture has gone out of venture capital and they're really all focused on jumping in late into proven winners uh, or doing very small investments very early. Um, but they're not really, you know, there's nothing huge that's truly innovative coming through the venture industry anymore that's working. Now, of course, he's a victim of the whole clean tech thing where yep. their, their best didn't work out very well and um, arguably if you know Coast was in that bucket as well and they did make some huge bets that didn't pan out. So it's possible that what we're witnessing is that the focus has not been on the industries we all work in. It's been elsewhere and it didn't pan out. But something quite dramatic is happening on Sand Hill Road, I think. What do you think is uh, the impact of this new kind of angel uh, list kind of uh, uh thing that's going on do you think that has anything to do with uh, the vc community running scared well if if you talk to uh, naval ravikan he will say that the syndication stuff that's beginning to happen on angel list well the first thing is it isn't real yet there's a there's a small number of people like jason calacanis and kevin rose who have meaningful syndicates but have yet to make investments using them so the first thing is it isn't that real yet but the goal is to be able to provide a company with money throughout its entire life cycle through to becoming independent. Whereas up until now, angels have just done the first phase. But the truth is that the second phase, which VCs normally did, is kind of gone away. The, uh, it, there isn't really money there in that second phase. So unless angels step up and build syndicates, companies are gonna die prematurely, which is happening. Um, and and uh, so he's saying, look, it's going to become more and more normal for a company to raise money on, on convertible notes throughout the entire early stage of their life, maybe the first two to five years of their life even. And uh, the source of that money will not be venture capital anymore. It will be angels acting together in consortiums. I'm, I'm not yet, I'm, well, two things. One is, I don't know how real that is. Secondly, I don't know how um, desirable it is. I, I, what I'd like to see is real venture capital making a comeback where people will make two to ten million dollar bets on yet to be proven big ideas. And I, I, I think that is absent right now. Kevin? Um, so, you know, the, the, I, I think the part of what's going on. I think the Aquahire thing is a big part of this, and part of this is that um, you know, Facebook is is now the Yahoo of, of ten years ago. It's the it's like the sort of big established place that the front page that everyone goes to, but nobody likes very much. But it's seen as the place that you get bought by, and that's that's a problem for tra for Facebook tra managing that transition because they cause they still think they're the innovation company and and move fast and break things, but actually they're now seen as this. Um, large established thing that everyone has to be part of but doesn't get excited by and that that's that's a cultural transition for them that's that's going to be true um, <clears throat> the, the 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 funding stuff is um, the, yeah the, the the challenge the challenge that you know the, I, I'm the thing is you know the venture has always been a, a, a very um, a lottery with a small number of winners because actually getting through um, the, the sort of the VC filter and getting funding was was always very very hard. Um, you know, at least in the last 
15 years well, okay 14 years um but the um but the, the the question is firstly we don't need as much money to build things uh, as we did before um in the web space and that may be partly that may be why the the, the venture guys are looking elsewhere so the, the stuff that Owen was saying about going back to sort of fascinating harbor innovations um building faster networking again um building device building more sensors and devices and connecting those and spreading those out um being areas of investment i think that's interesting and that's that's part of this of you know the, there's because um consumer web tech is easier to build now and even to some extent easier to scale though there's always challenges there um looking at these other these other hardware areas maybe where the um the unexpected investments come Robert, where do you think are the unexpected investments that are coming? Um, well, the one that I keep watching is uh, Kickstarter and uh, and the the uh, crowdsourced uh, funding. That th they seem to be funding some really interesting stuff that the professionals uh, just st still don't like to fund, particularly in hardware, which is going to bring some uh, interesting problems because building hardware is. Uh, it's hard. That's why it's called hardware. <laughs> um, and a lot of people are not going to be able to make their uh, their promised ship dates. And um, it'll be interesting to see if the Kickstarter community is bothered by that or if they really look at it as a little bit of a speculation that this thing will actually ship, you know. Um, I don't know. I, it, that changed, for me, that, that changed the, the world more than anything else out there in terms of the interesting companies I'm seeing. John Toshek. Yeah, I think that uh, most of the startups, I, I think this year was a, a good year for enterprise because a lot of the startups are just kind of figuring out what the platforms are to build their startups on that to associate the technology to. And, uh, you know, so the iBeacons came out. So, you know, they're figuring out what, what kind of startups will be on iBeacons. The, the platforms that um, such as Dropbox or Box or the startups from the previous few years, they're going to build platforms on top of those. Um, and so their startups are, you know, they've kind of gone through a little bit of a, uh, a lull in the normal channels. Uh, but I think that the startups in education and healthcare, and I don't even know the names of them. I just know that thousands are, exist. And I also think that, uh, you know, you could claim that the Bitcoin um, whatever you call Bitcoin now, uh, you know, success or failure, it's definitely newsworthy, has spawned off some very successful and very unsuccessful startups that are pretty important, uh, like Coinbase. But, um, and I, I don't even know when the other ones came around, Mount, Mount Gox or whatever. Kevin might know or Keith might know. But those are important. And I think so the, the areas of 2013, they went to different um, sections of the industries. And next year, you'll see a much more normalization, like normal as Robert's uh, term uh, for normal people. Uh, startups that are going to be very successful, and I think the VCs are, you know, are going to get, you know, involved again. It's not just going to be angels; it'll be the major VCs. Well, have I mean, this is, I guess, uh, directed to Keith. Haven't the VCs always been uh, risk adverse, risk averse, uh, and unwilling to? take chances on anything other than that larger equation of you know one in 20 or whatever it is that uh, the number of startups that exist I mean isn't that always been the case I think yeah but it's not to the extent that it is now um, I, th I think you started a new trend roughly around uh, late 99 early 2000 when the bubble burst um, of limited partners um, having huge oversight of what general partners at VC funds invest in. And that led to a wave of natural conservatism that just exacerbated the trend. And I, I think that got amplified when Yuri Milner came to the Valley and invested in Facebook at a crazy valuation, but did really well from having done that. That compounded the let's invest late kind of momentum. Uh, and then with the rise of Paul Graham and Dave McClure and the like, uh, the early stage got taken care of in a different way. And that further separated VCs from, you know, the early stage of, of innovation. So they became cherry pickers and number crunchers. And, and I think 
there is um, some truth that, that that was always the case, but uh, you still had the Vinod Coasters and the John Dawes and the Tim Drapers and the Steve Jurvetsons who would invest with their gut. I still think you do have those people. Some of those people still exist. Uh, Reed Hoffman is one of them, for example. But um, they're, they're fewer and fewer. Uh, and and I, I think that starts to turn Silicon Valley into a place that looks a lot more like um, other parts of the world, um, like London and Berlin uh, and even Shanghai, where um, you know there is really no traditional venture capital at all. Uh, I don't. I don't. I disagree on that. I think that. I think that the venture capital money that was put into the companies that went public this year will fund a whole new slew of investments. It's just a. It goes through a cycle, and and there was a lot of public company. A lot of companies went public this year, and they had venture capital funding. And this is going to. I mean, just an investment in Twitter, for example, would be huge. Uh, will fund a lot of different companies that that uh, start up. I think it's just a little a little lull as a, in this. Uh, I think it's going to be uh, it'll be fine. And the Silicon uh, Valley is still the place to go. Yeah, I don't disagree with that. I mean, I, I think the valley goes through cycles, and what I just described is not forever. Absolutely not forever. And in any way, in, in another way, you could interpret what I just said as an opportunity statement. There's a massive opportunity to move into invest. Investing in the probably two million to ten million dollar range in big ideas, they're going to change the world in in some of the ways we've talked about to do with wearable computing, to do with uh, obviously to do with mobile, uh, uh, to do with the transition of the enterprise to a uh, a less um, a less vendor centric, much more mobile kind of enterprise where there's. Um, you know, the possibility of individual employees with their own devices interacting with other employees through services that don't even exist today. Right. Do you think, um, uh, I saw a, uh, uh, I don't know where I was, somewhere, some conference somewhere, I think, and, and somebody was describing the venture capital community, and and, uh, and I saw the same kind of thing done about 10 years before, maybe in the late 90s. Before, in the, in the 90s, and just, and tell me if this is right or wrong, the venture capitalist funded teams, so people would assemble into teams, and they kind of bet on the team. And in this last one I saw, which was this year, they said that you already have to have the team, you have to have a product, you have to have a competitive strategy, you have an exit strategy, and all these things, which would automatically make them kind of behind the times in this, uh, yes. you know, how to get VC funding. Yeah. Is that tr still it's, true? It, it is very true, and it's even worse. So you've now got angels asking questions like that. Angels are, you know, before they make their angel investment, are asking about traction. Uh, right. You know, which is kind of because well, that, that's <laughs> they're an asking the questions the VCs used to ask. Yeah, but yeah. that's yeah. because the cloud is, has changed the dynamic of of how to get and, and you know utilize investment. It, it's. The, the numbers well, are much that, smaller at the front end. And the speed from entrance to exit is, is rapidly accelerating. Right. Although I do think that's overstated, Steve. Um, I mean, I, I spent the last two years running a startup, and I can tell you that whilst it's true what Kevin says, that you know the whole Amazon or Rackspace infrastructure lets you build things much more cheaply than before with much less long-term commitments in terms of hardware, the one thing that hasn't changed is the cost of people. So if you are if you're a ten person company, you're going to be spending one and a half million dollars a year on people. Uh, that, that doesn't really change. Right, but the so, point, point is, you need fewer people to get to traction. Is 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 the thing. You don't actually need as many um, ops people as you used to do to scale up, and you certainly need the hardware yeah, investment. That's true as well. You don't need as many ops, but you need more engineers because you've got to do Android, iOS, and web. Yeah, right. Imager uh, has, I think, about 10 employees, and they have 125 million impressions a month or views or whatever you call these visits. Um, yeah, I don't know how you can overstate the speed with which you can go, uh, as John said, from startup to uh, exit. It's uh, it's dramatically. I mean, if you want to call it aqua hire, yeah. fine. The, the problem with that, Steve, is that the noise level has gone way up as well. So getting... Um, Getting to be uh, known is a little bit harder, and it's also harder to hire talent at this point. Well, how did uh, how did Snapshot get known? 
It took them three years, Steve. It yeah. took them three years. They, they, they've been banging away at things that didn't work. And eventually, yeah, literally. Well, uh, but they, once and they, and how many, uh, how many other messaging things are out there competing for our attention? Uh, well, there's a there's a hundreds. list of them. I mean, there's WhatsApp. There are a bunch of like you know four or five yeah, but the, apps but have, that are dominating everything. There are like ten everything. of them that we've heard of that have done well, and there are th another thousand that haven't. That's yeah, I understand yeah. that. I mean, this is uh, I'm going to uh, put my uh, Hollywood analogy on this in a second. But the um, you know what was the time from the time when Snapchat pivoted to its current model from then to now was how long? Uh, a few months. That's when you point. hit it. You really hit it fast. That's incredibly compressed over anything that happened three or four. And years Rap ago. Genius was in the news too. That was a very fast, uh, you know, spiral. Uh -huh. Yeah, I think everything is. Well, they've fast been working on it for takes. three or four years but too. Pe people underestimate how long it takes to get to that point. Yeah, I mean, that, I mean, that's you know, this that's this is the lean startup inside, which is which I think was also part of um, that is spreading into the culture, which is you want to. Make sure that you've got a fast iteration loop, but what you're iterating on is what have I learned from the last iteration loop and what can I change and do it and getting it such that you can do enough of those that you can then find the one that actually gets the traction. Right, but isn't, I isn't suspect the part part of that, you know, the the, the actual um there's like the actual version of that, which is um using metrics that 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 quantify learning, and then there's the sort of folk folk version of that, which I suspect is what Keith is talking about with the angels, where there's where they're saying, give us some metrics that you know, give us enough and up into the to the right metric that we can um, put some faith into to invest, which is closer to the, to the old everything must be a hoggy stick thing. So there's, um, if you actually sort of go through the details of that that you know that approach and and think it through, it it does say do things quite differently, but um, it then ends. You still end up with some. It, you've got to have something that that takes off, and the and the uh, temptation is still to to measure something that. Um, Looks like it can look like a, a a high ramp to encourage other people to invest in you, and then you you get stuck in that metric and and find that actually what you want to do is something else entirely. So there there is there is um, there is still a we're still halfway through that cultural transition, and a lot of people are, are lagging behind that. I don't uh, think it's necessarily it, bad either. I I think that uh, the VC culture that's out there has uh, led companies to actually think through their uh, product strategy a little more rather than just throw something out there and see what sticks. It's still there. It's just that there there is a degree of successful companies where they have some kind of strategy to become bigger than what they are or mm -hmm. to have some strategy for how to get more, uh, attract more, how to pivot. What you know, They're just thinking through things more than they, than they did say in the dot com, which is, hey, we have a plug-in for a browser. We're going to get $70 million that we want to burn through. I want to I want to bring up something that uh, I don't hear a lot, but uh, John, for your uh, benefit, and maybe Robert as well, um, it was pretty clear a few years ago, uh, you know, say ten years ago, what the investment on the part of the media was in the success of these companies, and I wonder whether the fact that there aren't any, uh, you know, visible champions of anything on uh, a specific level like there mm -hmm. used to be. There there, it, there seems to have been a change. Uh, the stakeholders aren't necessarily coming from people who know how to uh, drive uh, viral interest in things. Uh, it seems to be sort of self-contained on the part of the startups. Uh, and therefore, as as you guys are all saying, there's uh, it's a much more difficult proposition. But don't you think that there's uh, sort of a uh, a missing uh, element here that used to be much more important than it is right now? I, th I would reduce it down to a single word, um, TechCrunch. I mean, if you think what Mike did with TechCrunch in 2005 through 2008, it wasn't really the media. It was uh, insider reporting with a point of view. That is to say, uh, I want these guys to be successful. Uh, and it provided both a meeting place and um, a publishing center for everyone. Uh, and and um, yeah, but, but you know, Mike Mike was uh, an outgrowth of an earlier time in the trade press, uh, where there were these you know uh, sort of standard bearers. Uh, what was the guy's name? Who was the editor in chief of uh, 
of uh, Infoworld for a while uh, became a Stuart. Yes, yeah, Stuart also, mm-hmm. for example. Yeah. People like yeah. that. Uh, I mean, Mike is sort of in that tradition and yeah. kind of innovated and and went beyond it, much in the same way that I think Robert has uh, innovated in the uh, evangelist uh, uh, space and moved beyond it. Esther, they call it Esther Dyson. <laughs> Esther died at the same. Yeah, Esther. Esther. I mean, there's, there are a lot of people, but uh, they they seem to have sort of retreated uh, at this point, or ha- you know, lack of interest, or much more specific interests. Uh, in things that don't necessarily capture the imagination of uh, this mobile uh, environment, I, but I that, wonder. But isn't that the normal cycle? Isn't it just that um, there isn't a truly organic bottoms-up equivalent of, of them? Uh, uh, there, there are businesses in the media, but there isn't really a truly bottoms-up organic champion of, of the of today's startups. So my analogy to Hollywood is this. Uh, when well, Keith was talking earlier, go ahead, Kevin, if you have something else. Well, isn't, isn't that what AngelList is doing? AngelList is, is doing the thing of that um, in a much more direct way rather than with a, with a journalistic emphasis. I, I, I think so. Hacker News comes to mind as well, by the way. Hacker <laughs> News is doing some, some good stuff in that. On that side. Mm, to yeah, some extent. But, I don't know. I see more uh, more action. On Hacker News is like is like the GitHub the worst has more access action than Hacker store. News does. You know, I mean, some of these sites that are actually doing stuff seem to have much more play than media sites that report on it. It seems to be sort of secondhand by the time it gets past the actual developer community. Well, I, I think you've got a master. Uh, I, I'll be extreme here, and uh, this is intended to attract uh, differences of opinion, so maybe it's too extreme. But I think what we've got is a kind of a master and servant startup ecosystem where the master hundred startups are by combinator, and the servants are the two engineers with an idea. And basically, there's a very paternalistic. You know, you you get sanctified by Paul Graham or Dave McClure, and you're semi golden until you fail to get funding after Demo Day, and that is a very different psychologically. That's a very different feel to Web 2.0. When you had people saying to the old companies, "We're going to fuck you over. We're going to change the world," and there was no master and servant thing. It's almost like the, the you know the, the masters were the startup guys. It was people like Chad Hurley, and the servants were the VCs. Um, that seems to have been flipped into reverse, and the money is now the master, and the startup guys are the servants. That's how it feels to me. I I think uh, you're missing also the not just the money but the attention, and because there's the market is so crowded with so many startups. That there's a need now for gatekeepers of of the uh, Y Combinator and TechStars ilk, and they, they the uh, the reason I would give them six percent isn't because of the money. It's the fact that they get three hundred investors in a room at the end of the uh, of the class, you know, and they teach me how to how to uh, pitch to that to that three hundred people. Um, that's the value of, of Y Combinator. Yeah, I do the same at Archimedes Labs. I mean, we, we typically get 10% of a company, and uh, we, we, do, we do a lot of product thinking and go-to-market planning, but a lot of it is investor, the ability to get people in front of investors. But, you know, the truth is that it creates almost like the social security system for founders. It's like they're dependent on you. And that didn't used to be the case. There was no one to be dependent on. You had to stand up, do it yourself, and you raised VC money or you didn't. And now there's the, almost like this dependency culture. I'm not altogether certain, even though I'm part of it, that it's a good thing. So my analogy to Hollywood, thank you very much. I know you've been clamoring for it, <laughs> it is that uh, this comes from what Keith was talking about, about sort of the drying up of the middle uh, as the, you know, the, the early plays at the front and then uh, the longer plays at the back are taking all of the attention uh, and it's sort of uh, the same thing has happened with with Hollywood with films, and there have been people like Steven Spielberg and George Lucas, you know, an odd couple in this, uh, who've been complaining about how 
uh, you know, the ability to make a movie like Lincoln, for example, that Spielberg did, uh, that he almost couldn't get it on on the screens. That it had to go to television uh, up until the last minute, when somehow uh, he got a break from somebody. The theaters uh, were let it be a so-called real movie, and. Uh, so it, while everybody's sitting there thinking that the movies are going to, you know, basically dry up and and become this you know blockbuster uh, desert of, uh, you know, what, what's that one that you keep wanting me to see, John? You mean Game of Thrones? <laughs> no, no, no. Well, that, that's where I'm going with this. But the uh, Pacific uh, Rim. Thank you. You know, basically Fantastic Pacific movie. Rim three, four, and seven. Uh, instead. And I, you know, I I speak unknowingly about how incredible that film might be, but it is good. I watched it on the airplane back from China. It's 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 the best. It's, a, it's totally a guy movie, though. It's, it's, it's the best of the worst, is what you're saying. If you like B movies ever, if you like any B movie, you know, a monster movie, this is so over the top. It will just be your most awesome movie ever. Okay. So, uh, in that spirit, what while everybody's looking at the movies to say that they are falling apart, along comes television, or what we call television, this whole streaming environment, which is absolutely incredible. And, you know, Game of Thrones is, you know, I finally got sucked into it by a variety of uh, uh, suggestions. And it is awesome uh, in the way that it's just the latest binge, uh, you know, thing but i mean while we're all looking for the venture capital community uh to suddenly write itself something else is is starting to happen it would i would imagine you know binge software or some so, sort of uh you know uh <laughs> binge software. yeah that's the name of the show right there <laughs> well binge, if we get to the software. end of the show well i mean but you know binge Gaming is binge software. I mean, that that's where you you sit down and do yeah, a 40-hour uh, thing. Yeah, uh, but let's not talk about gamification, please. No, not gamification. I mean, actual games. That that was... Um, gamification the, of Thrones. There, there is this sort of... The, the myth of the shortened attention span um, has been promulgated through the through the print media for you know about a decade now, which has gotten very boring. But if you Short? actually look at what's been going on, um, the lengthened attention span has been driven by people playing these like long form video games that take 40 to 60 hours to to get your way through the plot and fight your way through the thing and so that has actually shaped um tastes in in, in a sense to understand long form works more and want more of these these longer term things this is which like, i think drives us drives the I agree. binge watching model as well i i agree i don't agree with the uh, the idea that it has anything to do with gaming software but uh, i think that you know the longification of yeah. uh of uh, of the stuff is important, but it reminds me of uh, somebody was talking yesterday about uh, what do you call the things before the movies? Uh, Pre previews, trailers, trailers, exactly. <laughs> Although they're supposed they're to be called the they're called trailers because they aren't trailers; they come before the movie. It used to be, however, that uh, people would go to the movies and they would see double features, commonplace. When I was a kid. You go down and you saw, you know, two Jerry Lewis movies with a bunch of trailers at the end. The idea that's what's shifted is that we're we're coming back to this much longer form, more substantial, where they get you into the theater or they get you into the binge, uh, and then they when they've got you there, they basically do everything they can to make sure you don't leave. And isn't that what engagement is in the software industry? It's it's about once you're there, don't leave. And we'll do anything to keep you there because a large percentage of the dollars that emanate from you, what is the enterprise term? Annual? ARPU. Yes. Uh, will, will flow to the winners of these, uh, you know, battles. So... Is there is any, anything going on here that we can identify as a something that really manifests itself in 2013, or is this just been a transitional year where we don't really see the moving parts that much? Robert Scoble. Um, hmm. 
in in a way it is a transitional year i'm not uh, you know there's a reason i did this book you know age of context because i i i saw the transition coming um and we're we're underway the transition is um we now have a mature mobile system right uh whether it's android or windows phone or or iphone and we're now looking forward to what that means um next and I, I, I don't know where to go with this, but we are in so, sort of a transition year um, that a lot of new technologies are cooking, and um, and that that's what I look at is where it, where is stuff cooking? Wearables, for instance, is cooking. It's not here yet. Uh, you're not going to put something on your face for maybe three, four, five, maybe even eight years, right? Um, but we now have the Newton, or we have the Apple II. Uh, of this new age, and and we know it's the future. It's coming. Um, we we know these three D sensors are cooking. Uh, Apple bought one company. There's others. Um, I was just at Meta th- last week, uh, which is making a, a wearable gaming device or a wearable uh, computer, um, and they're using one of those three D sensors to build a new kind of user interface, a new kind of human machine interface, and that's cooking. It's not here yet. Um, you know, I'm I'm about to put up a video with the Oculus Rift, uh, which is a wearable uh, 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 virtual reality system, and that's cooking. And it's not here yet. So there's a lot of things that are cooking in our industry. Um, you know, even TV. Right? I, my brother told me he he uh, uh, cut the cable last this year. You know that that's a trend that's gonna uh, that's cooking cooking right now. Um, the data it, doesn't show that. Well, it it, uh, it it might not show it very much, but I'm hearing more and more people saying I got rid of my cable, and even I'm looking at doing that because it's you know 125 dollars a month in TV that I'm starting to move most of that TV over to online like uh, Netflix and Amazon and Hulu and all the other places I can an Apple TV right. So why don't I take that 125 dollars a month and put it into Apple TV, you know, where the quality is just so much better uh, overall um, if I did that, right? Um, the, the last bastion is sports, and I'm not a real big sports guy, and neither is my, my brother. Um, but if you want to watch the NFL today, um, you probably need cable or something like it. My, my, bro- my other brother owns a bar, and he says, I can't get the sports into my bar any other way other than through cable. Well, if, if that last bastion falls and goes to Apple TV or something like it, and like a Chromecast, I mean, I got another Chromecast here, you know, um, then, then what happens to the cable business? Uh, it, it really is. It, it's in flux. We, we are in a transition year in a whole uh, number of ways. And uh, it's, that made 2013 interesting to me. But I, th- I think the things that you just spoke about, Robert, are all true. But I think that you could say that we're in a transition. It's not just a year. We're probably in a transition five to ten years uh, when some of these major things are going to change. I think um, <laughs> that the, 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 the idea of things cooking is a good way to capture it. Uh, John mentioned iBeacons earlier. I mean, if you think of the implications of iBeacons, and the interesting thing, I've been doing a lot of research about iBeacons, and what the most interesting fact I came up with is that uh, every every smartphone can be both a transmitter and a receiver. I, I, somebody sent me an article that says Android can't transmit. Is, it, is, no, it, it, it can. It's just a software thing. As long as it's got it? low-power Bluetooth, yeah. iBeacon is a software uh, stack, not right, but somebody hardware. sent me an article saying that Android can't yet transmit. They can receive the beacon signal, and and okay, great, but transmitting is uh, something that Android. And I've heard this from several people that Android is, is behind Apple on. And I I think Apple, if they're it, it, smart, it, it is, is going to bang it, that home this next it, year. It is, but that's a software problem, not a hardware okay. problem. So it just needs. So, so, well, this is a real problem, though, for Android because of the fragmentation of its in, of its uh, platform, right? If they come out with Android four point, you know, whatever, uh, uh, a new Android to turn on the beacons, um, not everybody's going to get that, and the carriers, you know, are so fucking slow on getting their updates through. 
it, it really uh, it pisses me off about Android that that I can't stay up to date with the latest bleeding edge of that platform um, on most on most of the phones that I have. Well, one of the things we're doing at Archimedes Labs is we we just formed a new company called iBeacon Works, and iBeacon Works is all about um, what are the implications of the fact that everyone is transmitting. Yeah. Um, and, and what is uh, what does a modern office look like in the world of iBeacons? Most people are focused on retail, but what about you know if you walk into a conference room and the conference room knows you're there, and uh, you know the calendar is ambient in the room and the resources for the meeting are all available. Yeah. You, you can imagine user experiences that just would have been impossible or very smart science fiction. And it's all to do with um, the, the atomization of identity. Uh, you yeah. won't have these big centralized identity portals anymore like Facebook or LinkedIn. Everyone's phone will be their identity. Yeah. It's really interesting giving talks to like at LeWeb and uh, uh, at the computer science uh, department in Cork Ir or in uh, Dublin, Ireland. Nobody knows what these low energy Bluetooth radios does. And and nobody knows that they're carrying one in their pocket, right? Right. Um, right. I, I've only had one audience that, that got it, and it was the audience at a uh, uh, Highway One, which is a hardware incubator. So, uh, you know, those people are uh, the type of people that that understand this new world that's coming at us. But uh, uh, everybody uh, else go, does not have a clue what these eye beacons do. Even in Shenzhen, I was spent some time in China, as you know, and, in, uh, and I was asking people in Shenzhen who are usually the first to copy everything, uh, have you been, you know, what do you think about eye beacons? They didn't know what they were. And, yeah. and, and uh, that's going to bite them in the ass because I honestly don't believe there'll be an office building of any size five years from now that doesn't have an eye beacon, not just in every conference room, but uh, down the corridors and in the canteen, so that you literally could say, where's Steve, and, and uh, you'd be able to find where he is. Well, it, it's interesting. I was sitting with uh, Michael Sippy, who runs a uh, product at Twitter, and they're playing around with uh, these beacons because they know an, th this could really uh, enable a new kind of social network, one where you actually c can walk into a, a conference and automatically every tweet there is hashtagged at that space. You know, um, That's quite quite exciting. And... and uh, uh, I know uh, some of the guys that, uh, uh, who are building the news feed at Facebook, and they said they're also playing with them. So I think we're going to see a new kind of social network uh, ship in 2014 with these uh, low-energy Bluetooth ra radios. I'm not sure that either of those guys are, are really going to nail it, and that might leave an opportunity for somebody new to come along and really do something uh, fun, you know, it's sort of like a highlight. But right. I, I I have to talk to Paul at Highlight. I I like the design of the new highlight, but it still, it still has so little utility, um, and it gets back to the addiction. It just doesn't addict me, um, and there's a whole okay. level yeah, the key, why it doesn't. So the key to me there is to do with control. Um, it, uh, there needs to be really simple ways to control whether or not you are visible in a context, uh, or whether you're invisible in a context. And usually these apps that, that try to be, uh, you know, who's around me, uh, don't give you any control whatsoever. So you end up either having too much irrelevant stuff or not enough stuff. Those are the two problems that you mostly have. But if you give people control, uh, uh, I call it cloaking, yeah. coming from Star Trek, you know, being cloaked or being uncloaked. Um, and you, met, you put that into the, the world of iBeacons uh, and with uh, the cloud as the... Yeah, I think that's like right. I think yeah. that's right. When you say, you know, where's Steve, you know, I'm going to figure out very quickly how to make sure that nobody can find me. Right. Yeah. I mean, I think that's going to be a, a... That's what the Snapchat appeal is, although I think Snapchat goes much deeper than that. Actually, downstairs I have a new pocket for uh, one of my jackets. That's a transmission-proof pocket, so <laughs> it, it it keeps your phone and your RFID tags and everything else from transmitting. So that's one one uh, crude hack that people are going to use if they don't want to be found. <laughs> 
So one of the biggest things that happened this year, well, there are a couple things, but... By the way, just before you go there, Steve, I hope nobody watches this show because I think we just gave away like trillions of dollars of valuable product information. Oh, well, <laughs> don't worry. <laughs> <laughs> this is the best kept secret in technology. But um, a lot of VCs watch this show. Yeah. Maybe that's Bring why it. they're so so unhappy and doomed. Yeah, but I thought we just established that there were no VCs anymore. So, well, I think there are a lot of angels trying to find their get their wings. Yeah, but uh, <laughs> but by the way, Charlie Isaacs, uh, I think he works with you guys at Salesforce. He's in the chat room. Yes, he does. Uh, and he said it's interesting that Android picked NFC, and Apple said we're not supporting it. Apple comes up with iBeacon, and now Apple Android will scramble to support it. And there's a deep reason why. And it comes to all the speeches I've been giving all year. I, I ask people who has an iBeacon in their pocket, and everybody doesn't raise their hand. And then I s ask everybody, okay, who has an iPhone with iOS 7 on it? Uh, and at, at every speech, 60 to 70% of the hands go up. Um, that shows that the tech passions around the world are still very heavy on Apple. And it's those tech passionates who are going to force the industry to follow Apple. As long as Apple keeps those tech passionates, they are in the driver's seat yeah, of that's, that's, where the industry goes. That's exactly right. And, you know, the biggest release that uh, Apple did in the last three years was enabling automatic upload uh, and updating. Yeah. That was the most important thing that they did. And, it, it, it you know, basically, as John Toshek will point out, uh, they finally caught up to uh, Android in doing that. Uh but it's it's a different thing when Apple catches up uh, because they bring with them, I mean, the holiday season, what is it, five to one in terms of purchasing on uh, App iOS versus Android? That's a flawed study, though, don't you think? Well, Flawed it, by what? The, the thing I watch is who are the tech passionates. When you go to a low web and you have, uh, have 3,000 people from 60 countries there, and these are very, very tech passionate, those are very heavy iPhone uh, audiences. And it doesn't matter that Android has nine devices for other every iPhone sold. Uh, it will eventually, but right now Apple is still in the in the driver's seat as long as they can hold on to those tech passions. If they true. lose the tech passions, they lose everything, right? By, by the way, true in China as well, Robert. In yeah. China, I was in very large conferences, and uh, I did not expect to see as much Apple stuff given China and Apple, but in fact, it was very dominant. Well, they they have a lot of uh, white label, or you know, they have people buying st stuff over here and then just uh, you know shipping it over there. Well, uh, talk, talk about China, though. Uh, you know, I I, I, I just don't want to lose the uh, John's point about uh, flawed study. So continue, okay. Robert. But I want to get to that. I I, I talked with Hugo Berra, who is now the CEO of uh, Xiaomi, and uh, in China, they sold half a billion smartphones in six months. And that's another thing that's cooking is China's dominance of the industry is cooking. And that might be a five to 10 year thing. But you watch, uh, Hugo told me, I'm coming after Apple. I'm not coming after Apple in America because that's going to be a harder thing. But he's going to go after Apple in every country around America. Um, and it'll be something interesting to watch. I, I think he has a, a real shot at totally changing the 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 mobile marketplace with its brand called me am i okay so a uh, flawed study john well i try not to highlight uh, flawed promotional materials from companies uh, pushing the idea of big data analytics but uh, in this case uh, the the study said that it was five to one of shopping on ios versus android right right okay but that's I think most of the people who are shopping are probably using iPads, and the the study would show that, I, I don't know, you have to look at the details of this, but if most people are using iPads for the shopping, and iPads have a 7 to 1 ratio of iPad sales to Android tablet sales, then they should divide it up in the segment of tablets by region rather than by just operating system. It's not well, the operating I, I system think that, that would matters be as much, it's the, it's the device usage. Yeah, but I don't but, know. I mean, I, you that's know, the, remember that's the only reason I think it's a flawed study, not that it's wrong. Okay, so uh, just uh, I would only bookmark that and remember that 
uh, that the iPad was the original device and that uh, uh, Steve Jobs went with the iPhone as, as a way of building a channel for the iPad, not the other way around. So uh, I think that it, it's not a flawed study. I think it's it's based on data which proves itself out no matter what you which way you look at it. But they have to do the tablet analysis because I, how many how many things did you purchase on your iPhone? I mean, I, you, you might get a movie or something like that. But if you're talking about Amazon Prime usage, I just I think it's mostly tablet. Well, I, I don't disagree with you, but I, I use these things interchangeably, and increasingly I use the phone because it's e faster to get to uh, and easier to operate. Uh, but, you know, for anything that is, it's like looking at a, at a tweet uh, and then going to uh, the source uh, material, the article. You so know. let's not call it a flawed study. It's a flawed promotional uh, piece of material. Well, I think it's not flawed at all. I think it was highly effective. <laughs> <laughs> okay. For well, people who don't care, <laughs> yes, I, I, I'd say flawed or otherwise, it's still incredibly significant that the gap is that big. Well, that, but the other the other thing is that that play was catching up. I mean, just a, a week before Google Play is catching up. I don't believe that at all. Uh, and mostly they talked about in-app purchases, that the free, the free model of Google Play was at, you know, actually outdoing the Apple Store. I don't believe that one either. I mean, I'm not, yeah. I'm not playing one side over the other here. I just think that they're all just a bunch of crappy studies that come out. Yeah. Yeah, well, it's true in everything. I mean, there's also a lot of you know, hidden sponsorship behind a lot of these studies that you don't really know who's benefiting and who's paying. Well, this uh, is America, and I can well, I can believe in whichever crappy study that I want to. <laughs> <laughs> uh, we happen to believe in a lot of crappy studies. <laughs> That's right. And we'll c continue to do it as long as it's our job. All right, so I want to, uh, in our remaining time here um, in 2013, I would like to uh, ask you wh what's going to happen uh, in the next year that's going to cause you to say that 2014 was just basically a holding pattern for uh, <laughs> you know for the tech passionists or whatever it is let's start with you Robert I mean you really think something's gonna happen or is this a four or five you know when I ever I hear you or anybody else say five to ten years it's like are you kidding me well five years is a long time right yeah Facebook got to so be one year. Five years. come in uh, and so did Twitter and so did YouTube um, I don't know. I just see a lot of signals of, uh, of things coming. We're getting much better sensors. The sensors are coming down in cost exponentially very, very quickly. Uh, we're getting really nice high-res screens coming along. Um, so we're going to see a, a continuation of the smart glass um, kind of thing. We're going to see a lot of that come out. We're going to see... Um, I don't know, a lot in mobile. I, mobile now, I mean, how many people got a smartphone this year? A billion people? That's, uh, that, that continues to force entrepreneurs to invest in new things for, for, the, for the mobile platforms. Um, one thing we didn't talk about was Edward Snowden, by the way. Um, I think he had a pretty dramatic uh, impact in the tech industry this year. I, I don't know that anybody changed their buying behaviors this year, but... Um, it, it you know it came up in the chat room you know we joke around about the NSA now um, I don't know I, we're, we're gonna see a lot of new uh, cool stuff next year uh, okay well what about Twitter watches do you think Twitter is going to uh, go through the roof this coming year uh, I, I there's, see, a, there's an undercurrent I see good, there's I an see undercurrent of, of people who are starting to talk about Facebook as, as being on the edge of uh, collapse. I mean, you know, some people overstate it. But hang on, let me just make ask the question: uh, that Facebook has basically peaked. Uh, that Instagram, Snapchat, WhatsApp. You know, our our friends over uh, at uh, I keep uh, cubed uh, Benedict Evans and uh, uh, Ben uh, Baharan uh, have had a series of amazing. Uh, podcasts about this uh, mobile uh, climate, and they're very bullish on this. And I think uh, Benedict Evans, in particular, I I can't quite read what he's saying, 
but uh, it appears that what he's saying is that Facebook's in trouble. Um, and, uh, you know, I think that's and that a beneficiary of that might be. I'm not saying Benedict thinks this. And, you know, everybody who listens to this show should, uh, you know, get it from the horse's mouth with these guys because they really know what they're talking about. But, but, uh, but I, I think that's a logical, a logical point. And Benedict's very logical. And um, I will say, for the record, when I started Just Me two years ago, uh, that was why I did it, because I thought Facebook would be in trouble because of mobile. I'm not asking whether Facebook, is, whether we agree on that or not. What I'm trying to do is to pivot off of that to talk about the Twitter opportunity. There are a number of people who think that Twitter came into the market, into the IPO market at the right time, mm -hmm. that they, uh, you know, uh, what's his name? Uh, Zuckerberg is unloading, a, you know, a significant amount of stock as, uh, as he, uh, you know, tries to uh, move into philanthropy. Uh, you know, there are a number of signals which the street is going to interpret as causing, you know, uh, causing a shift. And there are some people who think that Twitter is going to be the beneficiary of this. And that's really what I'm asking Robert. Uh, you don't think so, do you? I don't think so either. I, I, I just don't think so. I, Twitter is uh, a, a great thing, and, I, and I'm continuing to pour a lot of time into it. Um. It, it's just uh, Facebook has your very tight social circles, and Twitter is never going to have that. And anybody who says Facebook is going away just is not rational. <laughs> I'm sorry. Okay, maybe the teenagers aren't using it that much anymore. Uh, fine. But that does not mean it's going away or, or uh, is not important. There's nothing like Facebook out there, and and I don't think there will be. I, um you know, you know, you've got to, you've got to. Uh, if you look at the market caps, Apple's market cap five hundred billion, Google's market cap three hundred and seventy three billion, Facebook's market cap one hundred and thirty five billion, Twitter's market cap thirty five billion, roughly the same as Yahoo is at forty one billion. The market is kind of smart, and the biggest market cap there is Apple's. Second biggest is Google's. Um, it feels to me as if the infrastructure for the next 10 years isn't going to be a, an infrastructure owned by Facebook and Twitter. It's still Apple's to lose and Google's to lose. Um, Google's doing a better job of losing it, I think, in software than Apple. Um, I, I still would probably bet on Apple if, if you had to bet on one. But where is the new companies that are going to reimagine this whole platform for human beings based on not having a legacy in the web? That, that probably is the biggest unknown. Kevin Marks. Um, I think, you know, I, I, yeah, we're not, the, this, we're not saying that Facebook's going away. We're saying that Facebook has become a sort of known, stable part of the infrastructure that isn't going to grow much more um, and is... You know, is is a, is a steady. You know, it's part of the environment. Um, it's not sort of. It's no longer the thing that's turning other things upside down. It's it's part of the environment that people understand and use as 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 part of that. Um, and Twitter is on its way to being that too. Twitter is a is a known quantity that is um, that is used in certain ways by certain things, and you can plug things into it and, and get things spread and, and 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 so on. So I'm not sure that. Yeah, if you're looking for something that's going to have exponential growth, then not, then neither of those is is where you should be looking. But I'm assuming people aren't, um, aren't looking to to them for that. The the point is more that um, understanding that 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 they are part of the environment, but they don't define it, um, and and they're just another piece of infrastructure that you can use for you to to build new things on and, and as as part of the web. I think that's um, that that's my take on it. And I think you know something something that um, a couple of things that were said earlier that are that are interesting things that are growing. One is the um, Bitcoin and other virtual money type things that have that have got to the point now where they are um, not they're not at that infrastructure level yet, but they're starting to be understood and being able to be used for for other things. Um, and also the crowdfunding pieces where um, those are being those have got to the those those are now in the in a space where. Um, 
there's one set of things people understand what they're useful for, and there are other ones being built all the time that that fill in different gaps and, and fill out the the possibility space there. So that those 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 two, um, in a sense, alternative ways of funding things are, are very interesting. I think, and I think that the um, the sort of ten year assumption that advertising funding was the way you funded these the, um, these internet ventures. Um, was dealt a bit of a blow by the the app store model, but then that 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 sort of run its course to some extent now. But we've seen these other um, explosions of um, funding models, revenue models, and things that that aren't predicated on large mass market plus advertising, which this this previous wave was. So that means that there's going to be a a, um, a set of different kinds of things coming through that we that we haven't sort of, and that means we'll explore a different possibility space than we've seen. Josh Hashek. Well, it was hard for me to uh, interpret Kevin's uh, Twitter, the, the point about Twitter, except that he said it's a known quantity. But I think Twitter's value proposition is pretty unique uh, as a as kind of the dispatch streaming service for all current events. And there's nobody that's taken that place. I mean, Facebook has some real-time things there. And I don't think Facebook's going away either, I mean, obviously. Um, and even if it even if it lost... Well, what do you mean? Office is dead. Go on. Yeah, well, I wouldn't ever... I wouldn't say Facebook is dead. I wouldn't say Office is dead. I know. But Office is total... Office should die, and Facebook should not. It's the Game of Thrones, and I, you know, have my <laughs> thumb up on one and my thumb down on the other. No spoilers. So, what? I'm too far into it now. No spoilers. I'm... <laughs> no spoilers. Okay. Um, <laughs> I don't see how that was a spoiler at all. Anyway, um, just Twitter vigilant. Twitter is going to go on, and you can, you know, do pound G O T R, and or is that what it is? And you'll get it. You'll get all the news on uh, Game of Thrones, and won't, I won't spoil any of it for you. Uh, so, yeah, Twitter is uh, Twitter is going to have to pivot. I think that to reach a broader audience that has uh, higher levels of engagement, and video ads aren't the thing to do. I, I uh, think they're already got to be something else. I think they're already pivoting. If you look at the new Discover tab in the mobile client, it's uh, getting very, very good and getting exactly better right. all the time. And finally, uh, Twitter is getting filtering um, on par or uh, getting closer to Facebook. Um, it's just that the use case is very different. And um, I, I it's think hard to right hand, pivot, it's hard to but, hand somebody a Twitter account and say, here you go. Because they don't know exactly what to do. I mean, they, they follow some actors. They follow Justin Bieber. They, I don't know what the hell they do. Uh, for people who are who want to know news, Twitter is the source to go to. But I think but otherwise, that's... traditional sources of media are okay still. And I think Twitter has to put that value proposition of this is the immediacy that you need to know in order to get through your day. And they well, have to make that value proposition to a broader uh, string of people. Have... Somebody's using because there's half a billion tweets a day right now, and that's just a, a crazy number. That's just Vala Afshar. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah. I think uh, John nailed something there. The stuff you need to know to get through your day. I mean, whoever supplies that on whatever platform that is dominant is going to be uh, somebody you remain engaged with. Well, isn't that Google Now? I mean, that's what Google Now is going for, right? Not really. Google uh, Now... Oh. That's well, exactly what Google Now is trying to be. Is the th is the thing you look at t to get through your yeah, day. Yeah, but that you know, uh, with that's a lot of things you about your day. I mean, that's, no, I mean, no, it, just uh, Google Now is know. changing it's all, kind of all how the you time. have to interact. Google Now, if you walk into a conference room that has a DLNA TV, it tries to take uh, control of the TV. Uh, it, it tells you my airline tickets. It tells me uh, what my what the weather yeah, is I mean, going to be. Those are the tactical but, uh, things. In or I, you're literally taking what I said perfectly well, and I agree. Twitter is the uh, the the things that you should need to know in order to get through your day, which is the extraneous things that are happening in your circle, so that you can interact as a an intelligent, sentient human being, not just actually walking through your day. Yeah, which is why the fact that circles are incomprehensible uh, damages that value proposition. I agree with Robert that. Uh, that Google now is definitely making moves in this area. But the problem that Google has is one that they have in other areas, which is they're doing a lot of stuff. And, uh, you know, they're not focusing on what Keith is talking about as a value proposition. 
They're, they, they have a much larger and much more comprehensive play. On the other hand, if somebody does nail this, as Keith is describing, I think it's going to be huge. So here's one thing Google did that is interesting and not talked about much, is they combined Google Currents, I think, whatever the newsreader was. Uh, they got rid of the newsreader. Okay, that was last year. Then they combined their newsstand, which is the publications you buy, with news feeds from a, a bunch of sources, whether it's, uh, you know, fr from a variety of sources, like that would be in Reader. And they've coupled into one streaming thread. And now they can have some kind of conversation around that in the future that's not there now. We have conversations around that in what would be Google+. Plus. I haven't done it yet, but combining the newsstand is an interesting uh, thing that I haven't seen too much on. But it, it works really well if you subscribe to any magazines or publications on Google News. <laughs> Sorry for that buzzkill there. <laughs> well, that's, I mean, it's also that's, that's, that's kind of what we're getting Facebook is saying they're trying to do, which is to become... Um, the place that gives you interesting long form things to read, not just um, stupid memes. Um, that's that's something they've been sort of rumbling about for a f for a few months now, and trying to um, adjust what they show you in the in the news feed to actually be news. What do you um, mean by stupid memes, by the way? <laughs> um, I mean <laughs> memes that are just basically just you know cat pictures, um, inspirational phrases distributed as a, as as a JPEG. You know that's the. That's the sort of stuff that Facebook seems to be full of these days. Ah. Well, I won't defend Facebook. Robert? Um, I, I'm seeing a little less this week. Uh, they, they turned down the virality uh, uh, filtering. You know, it, uh, it's really going to be interesting watching these filters, how they compete uh, to increase the addiction of their product. Because if they show, if, if Facebook shows you 10 things you hate, um, you're not going to uh, engage with it. You're, you're going to get turned off by it, right? And if they show you 10 things that you actually engage with, um, that, that increases the amount of time that you're on that system and the uh, amount of advertising that it can show you, right? Um, you're talking, uh, 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 with the memes, we're talking about the uh, buzz, buzz uh, uh, upworthy, you know, kind of uh, uh, media companies that mm -hmm. are retweeting or re republishing all these interesting videos and curation, and, right? And they get a lot of likes and a lot of comments because it's fun content, but it is bubblegum kind of content. It's it's not content that's going to make you a a smarter human being, really. Uh, it's entertainment, um, and. Yep. Uh, well, that goes back to what John said, which is is the the information that you need to know. Yeah, that's different than the information that you feel like finding out about. You know, it's it's not gossip, but it's gossip that might impact on your job. Well, what's the, what's that thing that puts um, six crappy links at the bottom of every news story you read? Whatever that thing is called, because that's a oh, oh, outbrain. Outbrain. That's the one. Yeah, that's that's one of uh, many of those. They. Yeah. Uh, I hope they. I don't know. I hope they go away. <laughs> <laughs> but, Although I find it, but, but I think content. that's the problem. <laughs> well, the, but the problem is that it's um, it's creating this sort of feedback loop that rewards the sort of attention-grabbing, tacky headlines, and you know we've yeah, we had a, it's a temporary. flood of that this year with all the upworthy nonsense and those you know. 16, well, but the Wall Street Journal is it, is it really going away? I don't think. I, I think that they're they're just going to hit a, a peak next year. I mean, there's there's uh, it gets absurd. You know, they're, they're everywhere. It gets but absorbed. It's, uh, it's not going to be. I mean, you know, the the trade publication space went away when everybody started going for Apple links uh, in the enterprise because it drove traffic. And then all of a sudden, you had uh, absolutely no information about anything except Apple, which denied that they were an enterprise play. And then you know the advertising went away, and so did the, all those magazines. So I mean, this will not pollute the mainstream for long before it is a victim of its own success. Just my opinion. Okay. Uh, once around the table and we're out of here. Starting with Keith. So I was just showing my Google now, which was telling me the temperature in Palo Alto, which is where I'm sitting, and it was telling me the, the score from the soccer game yesterday, which I watched 
So it's kind of useless to me right now, the way it is right now. It's not telling me anything interesting. Um, You're not using I'm, Google enough then. If the more you use it, the better it is. Yeah, it's interesting. It's starting to turn into a feed reader for me because it's it, this, this new content available thing is, is showing up, which is sites I've clicked on. It says, oh, there's a new SKCD. You should click on that. So it, it's, it's, it's sort of eaten Google Reader and, and embedded in here. Now, it's not particularly great because if I randomly search for something, it will then give me you know um, updates about those new stories for the next three weeks, if it, even if I don't care about them anymore. But it's, it's starting to show me every time there's a new X, XKCD, I get a Google Now notification, which is actually quite handy. So you're, you're experiencing clickophobia. Well, no, I'm experiencing searchophobia. It's like if I, if I, if I was like, what is this? What is this meme about? I will search for it, and then suddenly that means I'll get Google Now alerts for, for the next week. And it's like, okay, that was a stupid meme. I didn't actually. Now I've I've satisfied my interest in it. I don't need to be sent those anymore. Google, thank you. Well, this is Robert's uh, little you know purse that you put everything into so that you can't be seen. <laughs> the cloaking purse. Okay, uh, Kevin, you want to leave with with that? Um. Well, my 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 tip for next year is is still indie web stuff and and how that's going to have long term value i think that that i i did the i did a talk at uh, at the web which was 10 years ago and 10 years to come um and looked at what stuff has has actually lasted for for 10 years in tech and it's it comes down to um openness and web standards and things that were built um for people to communicate amongst themselves rather than things that that were built um, with other people in mind, and I think that that's that's going to be where we're going to see some interesting stuff coming in the next couple of years. Robert, hmm, I think uh, next year is going to be a fun year. Um, we're going to see a lot of wearables, um, a lot of new uh, new things, and I'm looking forward to it. John, acquisitions, more risky Google behavior. Some consol a lot of consolidation in social, uh, consumer social, and I think it's going to be another year of the enterprise. <laughs> Every year is a year of the enterprise. But this, but the last year, this 2013 was huge, with yeah. all the things that happened. I mean, it's just going to get bigger and bigger, and it's going to be the plumbing that all these other consumer things strap themselves onto, and it's going to give the rise to the new VCs, which figure out that these little siloed consumer companies are worthless and they'll invest in companies that are attached to something that has growth potential. And that's the enterprise of 2014. Okay. I want to thank Rackspace and particularly Rob Jess, without which we would not be where we are. I want to thank, uh, uh, in that context, I would like to thank Robert Scoble for his incredible uh, spirit and uh, success in uh, in doing whatever the hell it is that he does and getting away with it. Congratulations. That's the trick. For 2013. <laughs> uh, Hi, Rob. My, my boss is watching. So <laughs> excellent. Uh, I want to thank... Uh, he hates the shirt, by the way. He hates the color green on me. So. Are, are, are we done yet? No. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> He's calling you now. Uh, I want to thank uh, uh, New Tech, uh, and uh, the more I learn, the more excited I get. Uh, Tina and I have been pouring through uh, the materials for the uh, launch of the new show, and uh, uh, we hope you'll enjoy it and other things that are going to emerge as a, as a result of uh, New Tech's investment in, in the Gilmore Gang. We appreciate it, and we're looking forward to it in the future. Uh, I want to thank uh, Kevin Marks for his infinite wisdom, and uh, somehow you're making more sense to me, and I know that it's not because you're slowing down in your speech, <laughs> so uh, uh, we, we value you tremendously and hope that you will continue on the show. Thank you. Same thing for uh, Keith Tier. You are, uh, uh, you know, all this stuff that you know about and unfortunately have had to live within uh, in a very trying year for you, you seem to have come out of it the, uh, the, for the better. And we're excited about what you're going to come up with in the future. Thank you. And John Toshek, uh, you are uh, uh, many things, but uh, I, I think your analysis at the end of the show, uh, we'll look at it again next year, I hope and trust, and uh, we'll see 
how incredibly on target you are. And uh, I thank you for your uh, beleaguered and reluctant uh, participation. Hey, that would be a great farewell show. What? So bye. (laughs) What did you say, Keith? I said it would be a great feature for you to have with a new TriCaster. You know how on Meet the Press, the guy always says, here's what you said last week. And they play it to him and then make him answer. Yeah, the only problem with that is that the guy who does meet the press is an idiot. And True. it doesn't matter what he said last week. It was wrong then. It's wrong now. <laughs> <laughs> they should have gotten the other guy with the goatee, who's the White House reporter. He's great. But uh, uh, last but certainly not least is our producer and director, Tina Chase Gilmore. Uh, she has turned this show into truly... Uh, a uh, visual experience in ways that you have to actually be in this room here and as much as we can sort of deliver some of that feel you have no idea how amazing it is for us to be able to look at all these people all over the world and have them engage in a sometimes difficult and technically confusing conversation it's a miracle that we live in this age and uh Uh, I hope we continue to do it for a very long time to come. I want to thank everybody in the chat room. You guys are amazing as always. You are the fifth guy. For those of you who remember the Fireside Theater, you'll know what I'm talking about. And uh, thanks to everybody who showed up, and especially those who didn't. We'll see you again next time. Next year. Bye-bye.